Dermot and Eilish Finucane have been married 14 years. For most of those years, Dermot has been a member of the IRA. Eilish opposes violence. It doesn't matter on what side you are. I mean, I, I feel totally the same about the police or the British soldiers. You know, I just don't think any person has a right to take another human being's life. I, I mean, I, I have been involved in a conflict which has resulted in people's deaths. I mean, maybe I did not personally kill them, but I have been involved in a conflict that, that resulted in people's deaths. Four months ago, this film could not have been shown. Now, with the ceasefire, the media can speak to the IRA. But even in talking to the enemy, there are rules of engagement. Questions that can't be asked, information they refuse to disclose. Because for Republicans, the British are the enemy. I made an approach to someone who I thought could put me in touch with someone else, that type of thing. And I told them I was interested in, in getting involved in armed struggle. And they said, well, we'll get back to you. I thought it was going to be a matter of, like, you know, next morning, knock at the door, come on with us, you know, that type of thing. But it, it went on for a way, and it went on for a few weeks. And then within those few weeks, I mean, I was having a change of heart and going, oh, my God, am I ready for this? And, you know, am, am I capable of it? Dermot Finucan joined the IRA in 1979, and by the time of his arrest, two years later, was one of the most wanted men in Belfast. Convicted of possessing firearms, he escaped from prison and reached the south of Ireland. He now lives there, having beaten the British government's attempt to extradite him in 1990. Under British law, he still has 23 years left to serve. My father has never and never was a Republican. He was apolitical. When soldiers actually used to raid our house, I mean, they'd, they'd burst in the door, they'd get everybody up out of bed, and, and, I mean, we knew they were going to be arresting someone or harassing someone of, of our family. Us as children we were very resentful or angry. Um, and my father then used to go and ask the soldiers, did they want tea and did they want sandwiches? And I mean, I think if they wanted a fry, you'd have made them a fry. The police were never in my home or searching it or... Well, it wasn't apparent to me that they were in our neighbours' homes either, so I led a very sort of normal childhood as such. But life changed for Eilish when she started going out with Dermot. We met in a local youth club, which was just beside my house, when I was 14. One day, one of my friends came to me and one of my school friends and said, you know, do you realise that, you know, Dermot's brother's in prison? You know, as if God keep away from this family, you know? So then I decided to ask him, and he said, yeah, that it was Seamus was in prison and that um, he had been involved in the struggle. And then Dermot started to tell me more about his family. John was an IRA volunteer. He died in 72. Seamus, who's four years older than me, he was interned when he was only 16. He used to harass my other brother, Martin, things like that there. I'm the youngest. And like sort of went down the family as each brother reached a certain age then. They were treated in a certain fashion. And then one day, I reached 17, and uh, they came to my house, and they were taking me for the first time to Castle Ray. At this time, the Castle Ray Interrogation Centre was operating a system indicted by the European Court of Human Rights as cruel, inhuman, and degrading. Years later, Theresa Brown was to be held there too. I had a brother interned for almost two years, and he was released after that time with, with no charges. I seen my, my mother beaten by the British Army, I seen my father beaten, and um, I seen my younger brother. He was harassed as a schoolboy. When you experience things like that, you, you want to do something that you feel can change and make your life better. Theresa Brown came from a strong Republican family. Both her brothers were imprisoned. Her sister is serving life for murder. There are several choices open to um, anyone interested in playing their part in the struggle, which is what I've seen myself as doing. There are people 
who allow the, the Republican movement to use their homes um, as safe houses or indeed anything else that they might require it for. If I can just put it this way, the opportunity presented itself to me and um, I gladly grasped the opportunity, which, which eventually led to me being in prison. Theresa Brown was sentenced to five years in McGabry Jail for storing explosives in her home. She was released this year. What would you say to people who say you're nothing more than a terrorist? Well, I would think that anyone who would say that I'm a terrorist must be very misinformed because I certainly don't see myself or any, anybody involved in the Republican movement or the struggle for the liberation of Ireland as terrorists. They're ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, um, simply trying to reunite their country, which has been wrongly partitioned. To me, it was just the progression of being a Republican and being active, and to me, it was just giving support. I mean, that, that was the part I was playing, was giving support. It wasn't um, something I woke up one day and said, I'm going to do this. It was just, it just happened that I gave support to the armed struggle. They said there was an informer being interrogated in my house, for which I was arrested and received a prison sentence. Veronica Martin's house had been under surveillance for some time. It was used by the IRA for the interrogation of at least two informers, one of whom was later killed. When the security forces raided the house, eight people were arrested. One of them was Sinn Féin's publicity director, Danny Morrison. Veronica Martin was sentenced in 1991 to three and a half years for false imprisonment. Her husband was jailed for 12 years. Cleared on a charge of conspiracy to murder, Danny Morrison is serving eight. There's also the, what's called active service. You can get involved in that, which is not something that, that I did. Um, certainly, Many years ago, before I had children, something that I probably would have thought about, but never did. I'm not really sure why, but maybe because I wasn't brave enough. People were telling you that all this will change, but nothing was changing, and the only the only people that seemed to be doing anything about it, in an active sense and in a, an obvious resistance sense, was either the uh, Republican movement. And I joined the Republican movement in May or May or June 1972. Bobby Story became one of Belfast's most senior Republicans. He was interned and remanded for a total of five years. On operations in England, he was acquitted of conspiracy to hijack a helicopter and free a Republican prisoner from Brixton Prison. Sentenced in 1981 for possession of firearms, he became, two years later, the officer commanding a mass breakout of 38 Republicans from the high-security Mays Prison in the biggest UK escape since World War II. He was recaptured and eventually released in May 1994. Bobby's story is back at the maze. The object this time is to meet Danny Morrison, who is being released on four days parole. It's Morrison's first release in four years. Twelve days previously, two leading loyalists were killed by the IRA. Sinn Féin fear reprisals. Danny Morrison has come out of jail to launch his second novel, but the media are chiefly interested in statements on the peace process. The British people, probably, uh, certainly the British government, have absolutely no idea. I mean this. People should listen to what I'm saying. 
they have absolutely no idea at all of what makes us tick. I've read loads of books. I've read Alan Clark's diaries recently. He hasn't got a clue what's going on in this country. And the only time the British government is interested in what's going on in this country is when there's a bomb in their hotel. Right? And we want to move away from that and get them to listen to our rights. Morrison's book launch has taken him back to the Falls Road. It was here in West Belfast that Bobby Story started operating in 1972, and where seven years later, the young Dermot Finucane applied to join him. They kept a secret from Ailish. You basically told lies about what you were doing, where you were going, and, and hoped that you didn't get caught out. And then when you got caught out, you told bigger lies to try and get around the fact that you told a lie and, and things like that. But you, you did lead a double life. I sort of put two and two together and came up with my own assumption, you know. So at that stage, I kind of had to make a decision as to whether, you know, I mean, where were we going? It was very sort of frightening because I knew if Dermot and I stayed and had a long-term relationship that it would affect me greatly, you know. Can you tell me, did you disapprove? Yes, I did. Why? Um, firstly, because I don't think, no matter what the cause is, that anybody has a right to take another human life. Another reason for me disapproving, and a personal reason, was because I wanted us to have a normal life. Their wedding was far from normal. When Dermot and Eilish married in 1980, Dermot was fighting the British. He was on the run. During the wedding itself, um, other Republican friends of mine were arriving for the, the social part of it, and they were stopped outside it and being pee-checked and sourced and that. And a couple of guests at the wedding who knew me was, was nodding to me to look out the window. And when I was looking at the window of the hotel, there was a roadblock there and I'm going, what do you do? Do you run out in the band and you're guessing like, and declare to the world, you're, that's me they're after at that time. So we just sort of sat cool, played on and um, had the wedding and went on a honeymoon. It was great. At the time of the ceasefire, IRA sources claimed an estimated three to 4,000 supporters, up to 1,000 of whom were capable of carrying weapons. Of these, about 500 were full-time active fighters. In Belfast, they used guerrilla tactics around the city's housing estates. It um, involved active resistance on the ground against the British sort of presence in our country. The, the, any sort of definition that is not really sort of for me to go into, but um, it involved a fairly um, arduous and hazardous sort of existence. Um, it brought you in for a lot of attention from the RUC and the British Army. The British had success on some occasions and, and, and the IRA had success on other occasions. So there was, there was an ongoing battle uh, of like intelligence and counterintelligence and that type of thing of, of trying to outmaneuver each other. Um, and the cell structures was part of that. Um, campaign of trying to outmaneuver the British. Despite the ceasefire, the IRA structures remain intact. The Belfast Brigade has three battalions, though the reality is a network of cells comprising four or more members. Communication between cells is confined where possible to a single liaison officer. A general headquarters staff of around 30 is responsible overall for the day-to-day -day running of the IRA. Before the ceasefire, Belfast was the base for a third of all the IRA's full-time fighters, a total of about 180 men and women. There was different types of volunteers. You had people who were part-time who had jobs and things and were able to sustain themselves. Maybe they had flexi hours where they could sneak out and work on an operation and, and get back into their, their, their jobs. And you had uh, other activists who were full-time. I'm going to say full-time does mean that um, they didn't sign on the dole. They, uh, they were just working 24 hours a day for the, the, the struggle. And for those who were in that position, I was aware that they, they, they were given um, £10 a week. 
you know, if they were working in like in an area and people who was helping them was aware that, you know, these are the activists, you know, the boys or whatever you want to call them, that, you know, they'd take them out for a drink, you know, they'd buy them a drink, they'd get them a pair of shoes and stuff like that there. And, you know, they, and basically they lived off their community. I have never been regarded as a terrorist in any, in any circumstances or any community or any culture that I've grown up in. I've always been seen in my sort of, in my, in my uh, political light. There has always been an underlying rule that IRA membership is secret. On active service, members did not use, sometimes didn't know, each other's names. Breach of rules could lead to court-martial. Punishment for informing could be execution. There was a, 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 a rule there that you weren't allowed, even if you weren't on the run, you weren't allowed to stay in your own home. And if you were caught in your own home, you were thrown out of the movement. And, uh, and part of the reason for that was so that you weren't making yourself available for arrests, things like that there. And obviously if you're with a girlfriend or if you're married, you know, you want to be with your wife, you want to be with your girlfriend and things like that there. And there was times that, you know, that I would say to my partner that, you know, um, it's 11.30 at night, I'm supposed to go to my billet and I, um, ask me to stay, ask me to stay. And it'd be quite comfortable and, you know, he wouldn't want to get up and go, but he was very sort of aware of the fact that he should go. So he would turn the situation around to me and say, oh, please ask me to stay, you know, don't let me go, you know. And of course, I mean, I couldn't, you know. I, so I used to wave him goodbye and put him on his way. During the hunger strike of 1981, when 10 Republican prisoners died in a demand for political status, the IRA was fighting the British and shooting at soldiers. And myself and some comrades were engaged in um, a certain type of work. And that uh, we, we had a car, we were traveling about it. <clears throat> and uh, we were being sought after by the British. We were seeking them. And in the middle of like working with my comrades, I went, oh, Jesus Christ, it's my wedding anniversary. And they were looking at me going, what? And I went, I need to get this shop, I need to get this shop. My, com my comrades had said to me, you know, like, you can't, you can't do this, this is crazy, this is crazy. And I went, I need to do it, I need to do it, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. We screeched the halt outside this shop. I ran in, bought a box of chocolates, jumped back in the car, screeched off, heading up through Lana doing, doing handbrake turns here, and like, everybody looking after the car going, what's going on? And I think my, my memory of just by chance, Ellie's had actually had just left where we lived, and was on the road, and we just went, Right beside her and she looked frightened, you know, and I went, it's all right, here, listen, um, happy anniversary, here's a box of chocolates, I've got to go, see you later, bang, well, and then away again. There was a good trust, there was a good confidence, the mutual commitment by everybody was obvious, we all knew that we were doing uh, the right thing, we all felt morally, morally sound, well founded about it. But for Bobby Story and Dermot Finucane, time was about to run out. On August the 20th, 1981, the day the 10th hunger striker died, Bobby Story's active service unit shot a British soldier in Lenadoon. The soldier was hit in both legs from two shots and flying shrapnel, but he's not seriously hurt. Police and security forces sealed off the area as the gunmen tried to get away. I was driving a car with, the, there was two other Republicans in it, Bobby Story and myself, and a guy called Brendan Shannon. We were driving away with the, with the weapons in the car, and Depending on whose point of view you want to look at, but unfortunately for us, um, we ran into uh, an armoured patrol of RUC men. So the first day passed us, but the second one rammed us. The next thing, they opened fire and uh, there were machine gun in the car from a distance of four to five feet. The jeep in front then moved the try and sort of corner us, but it left a gap in the front of the road. Um, I sort of Dermot was able to see that and drove off through the gap. It was a fairly heavy car chase and things like that there. Then we attempted to get on towards the M1. A patrol had passed us and spun around and come after us. And just as we got towards the bottom of Kennedy Way, about eight RUC landowners came towards us. So we had to sort of do a full turn again and go back up towards the jeeps that passed us. But by that time, they were all closing in on us. So we were forced to pull up in a garage. And I went right and slammed the brakes on, jumped out. We all three was ran around the back of the garage. I remember seeing the amount of RUC personnel and weapons and realising it was arrested, realising it was captured. 
um, because it had been captured a couple of times in circ circumstances like that before. But the, um, the, a couple of the comrades with me, young and energetic and eager, and this is their sort of their, their, their first arrest in that type of a situation. And you could see that there was no, there was no sort of, there was no preparation there to sort of accept the reality of it. And I remember actually saying, listen, saddle down, where Dharma was saying, we'll go here, we'll go there, and I'm saying, saddle, saddle, we're caught. You don't want to get killed, you don't want to give in, you always think there's a chance. Um, if, I mean, I wouldn't have made it. I wanted to try it, I wouldn't have made it. And it was only with Bobby, I mean, that, that I stabbed. You don't know if you're about to be executed, because you know comrades who have been. And you tend to think, there's, you're taking it all in, you can, you can maybe see about 12 or MRUC personnel, you can uh, see X amount of civilians about. You know the civilians are probably the greatest uh, protection you have. Dermot's mum rang me to work to say that she'd heard he'd been arrested in Kennedy Way with two other fellas in a car. And if I was totally honest, I was very relieved. Story and Finucan were charged with attempted murder, but the Crown failed to prove that they had fired the shots. They were convicted of possessing firearms with intent to endanger life and sentenced to 18 years each in the Mays prison. From a young age, having felt that forgiveness was number one priority and, and that's what you do, that's the best thing to do. I think that was very much in our family culture and, and, and pretty in our whole culture, I think, that it, in the Christian tradition, I guess, that, that the aim is to forgive as quickly as possible. So I did it, I, well, I thought I'd done it immediately and stayed that way. Um, and later found out that I didn't, I hadn't. In the summer of 1976, when his son Robin was 12 years old, Christopher Hewitt Biggs became ambassador to Dublin. He held the appointment for 12 days. It had turned him into what the IRA called a legitimate target. He was on his way to work and there was a mine planted under the road. So it sort of blew the car up. They timed it right. Mum was in London, so as told by a friend's mother, there was this sort of sense of everything having stopped and yet everything being very chaotic, if you know what I mean. Um, I remember just being in the middle of it and being, pretty, being very confused. And I probably did cry, but straight away circumstances began to develop that, that made it hard to be open with how I was feeling. Somehow, for, for a whole lot of reasons, I, I, I didn't somehow allow myself to be angry. So many of you have shown. In the aftermath of her husband's death, Jane Hewitt Biggs appeared on television with her three children. It was a broadcast memorable for its appeal for understanding. None of us can afford to be equivocal about violence. Christopher was destroyed by it. But I'm sure that Christopher's death will not be in vain. I feel no bitterness. But I ask you to remember these convictions, which he had, which he felt so strongly. I find it difficult to talk rationally about it, because I still have, I, it does, just really make me very angry. But, you know, it's these words, legitimate target, active service, that they just, um, you know, that they just bear no reality. They bear no connection with, with the reality of, of blowing someone up because they've gone to work as a diplomat in a foreign country.
With seven weeks to go to the IRA ceasefire, Ulster loyalists celebrate the defeat of Catholics at the Battle of the Boyne. Hatred of Republicans is as strong as ever. Prospects for peace seem remote. Tell me why there was a paramilitary presence here this evening. I would say it was a symbolisation of the, the griefs and the fears that the people have here at the moment. The people need to know that we have some defenders in this land that we will not go down without a fight. And what you've seen here tonight was an example of that. Are there any aspects of the Republican movement that you can imagine sitting down at the table and talking None to? None at all. I, as a unionist politician, will never sit with Sinn Féin or anything that represents Sinn Féin. And is that how the people of the Protestant community yeah. feel? 100%. All that right, folks? Yes. 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 I think you could, you could see that by the cheers that went up here when the effigy of Jerry Adams was burnt on the top of this bonfire. He's hated and detested. What is pog onophobia the fear of? Now, if you know this, don't be shouting out. Do you know? Spell it. Uh, P O G O N O P H O B I R. The Felons Club, West Belfast. Though the public is welcome, membership here is reserved for those with a conviction for IRA offences. The fear of beards. Okay, the temptations. Where's the temptations? Yes, for seven points. <laughs> Who had a hit with the song Love on the Rocks? Me, Damon. Me, Damon. Yo. Well done. This is Jerry Adams' heartland. But behind the scenes, he's driving a hard bargain, persuading Republicans to support a ceasefire. Are there any stickies here? Yes. Right, OK, that's two points. <laughs> when did Cahill Golding assume the, the role of Chief of Staff of the IRA? And there's a, no, a second part question is, what do the letters IRA stand for? <laughs> Nowhere has the IRA been so confident as in South Armagh. This has been the most successful area for the Irish Republican Army. No one would deny that South Armagh probably holds the cream of that army. And they're special and unique because of the commitment and ingenuity they have used in their war against the British Army, in the fact that they have had, thankfully, so few casualties, so few volunteers arrested, never had a supergrass down here. Home to up to 70 of the IRA's full-time fighters, South Armagh is arguably the toughest area for the British Army to control. Some of the most significant mainland operations were conceived here, the Bishopsgate bomb, the Downing Street Mortars. South Armagh was the last division of the IRA to accept the ceasefire. It could be the first to break it. In the British Army here, the cream of the British Army, with their multi-million pound weapons and electronic systems and everything else, they are ended up hidden in the boat holes in the hills and the barracks. In many ways, they are the prisoners, and the local people are the free people in this area. No doubt about that. It isn't just a matter of the Irish Republican Army either. It's the Irish Republican Army with the assistance of the local people. Because the IRA on its own could not deal with the British Army in the fashion they have done so well for a quarter of a century without massive assistance from the local people. Although most of the people here want an end to British rule, by no means all support the IRA. As ever, it's the innocent who are caught up in sectarian violence.
The McShane family have been victims of two loyalist attacks. The 16th of August, uh, 1976. It was on a Monday night, 10 to 10. Um, there was a car bomb outside a pub called The Step In. I was um, three and a half months pregnant with Gavin. And uh, it was a £250 bomb, wasn't it? Yes. No warning. So it went off. I lost my left eye. But uh, never lost the child. It's actually Gavin that kept me alive, you know, that time. Gavin was murdered on the 18th of May, just before 11 o'clock in the morning. Good man walked in until A&B taxis in Armagh and shot him. Put a gun to his head just there, point blank range, shot him. Gavin died instant. I dropped him off at school, as usual, just talked as normal going in the road, and uh, he just said cheerio, and it was just like a normal morning for us, a, a normal Wednesday morning. Gavin McShane was 17, one of the last victims from South Armagh before the ceasefire. He had that many friends. Uh, it was unbelievable. It would, uh, the amount of friends that uh, turned up to his funeral. Maybe uh, people think that, that because you lived in Crossmanland or come from Crossmanland, that you're Republican minded, but we were not. Never mm. were. It was just a case of getting on with your, your lives, being able to work, pay your bills, and get on with your life. Yeah. But which the the troubles has come into our lives again. Gavin McShane was the three thousand one hundred and forty first victim of the troubles. Over the last twenty five years in Northern Ireland, two thousand two hundred and twenty one civilians have died, six hundred and forty eight soldiers. 296 RUC officers, 29 prison officers, six children killed by plastic bullets. There have been 16,326 charges against Republicans and Loyalists. 12 prisoners, all Republicans, have died on hunger strike. 132 Republican prisoners have escaped from custody. Altogether, 12,000 Republicans are thought to have been convicted. For Dermot Finucan, a jail sentence of 18 years could have signaled the end of his marriage. The first visit shattered me. I prepared myself from the night before, having a bath, having a shave, putting my talc on, and all this, and you had to go out spotless. And, I mean, by the time the visit came, you were a nervous wreck. You, know, you had big sweat stains under your arm because you were just in anticipation of it. The first visit I spent, Apologising. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. And I'm sorry you have to go through this. I'm sorry that, you know, whatever. You know, because she doesn't share my political convictions. Um, and yet it has such an effect on her. You know, because she loves me, um, I love her, and I'm involved in what I was involved in. I think I sort of broke down and started to cry, and then Dermot was very upset. I mean, I was very upset that I'd actually done it in front of the prison officers and, you know, because, I mean, it's a very personal thing. I told her that um, there was no point in her coming up anymore. Uh, she said, see, a new life without me. Uh, you know, that it wouldn't last anyway. He came out and had it all prepared in his mind, this speech to say, you know, right, this is 18 years, you know, you're only 22. This is stupid, go off with your life. Obviously. I was saying it with no conviction whatsoever because I wanted her to stay, I needed her to stay. Um, I was in love with her. But I mean, at that stage, it's too late. You know, you're married, you're in love. You can't turn around and say, oh yeah, okay, fine, I'll go off now. So 
it just wasn't an option for me anyway, you know. And the other thing is, I wasn't prepared to let other people see that the minute there was trouble, you know, our marriage hadn't survived. So, and it, I mean, it did survive, you know, so. The statement was made about Republican prisoners were hoodlums, um, godfathers, gangsters. I mean, it probably is easier for people to believe that because if they believe that, then they don't have to start thinking about why the Republican uh, movement exists, why there's a war here in the six counties. Nobody I, I know ever joined the IRA or the Republican movement to intentionally cause pain and hardship and, and, and all that out of simply wanting to do it. You know, the, anybody that I was aware of was simply, they, they felt that they, that's what it took to move the British government. Um, unfortunately, British soldiers have died all through this and, and it, it's just tragic. But I mean, it wasn't because they didn't like the Brits, you know, the British people, that, that didn't come into it at all. We just felt we were occupied and wanted to change it. I, my perception of, of, of people in, in, in the IRA is that they're not people that I can discard or put away as evil people or is wholly different from me in any way. So I can sort of see, I, I can see those things, things that I might even admire, things that I can relate to. And oh, where I part with them is, is in this very, it's just the very simple fact of what I see is the, a, a, a basic lack of, of being willing to take any responsibility for the consequences of their actions. And that seems to be just, that seems to be a fundamental lack of, of exercising what, what makes us human. You know, that, that's what makes me angry, that's what I find disappointing, that's, that's wh where my respect ceases and is, is taken over by, by a lot of other feelings towards them. The feeling was there that the war was over, which was a sort of a relief. Maybe now we are going to get somewhere after 25 years of the armed struggle. A different phase has opened up in the struggle, and uh, so you felt, well, maybe this would be the end of, uh, of the conflict, the war, as an armed struggle. But as the weeks passed, confidence began to evaporate as people felt little had changed. The troops are walking around the streets now with barrettes on. I, I don't find that a big deal. They shouldn't even be on the streets anymore. They shouldn't have been there in the first place, but they definitely should not be there now because the, the harassment is still going on. Misgivings in Belfast are felt even more acutely in South Armagh. The progress of the ceasefire is a topic many Republicans refuse to discuss. But as army patrolling has been uh, stepped up dramatically since the ceasefire because those brave heroes of the British Army who were afraid to come out on the roads pre-ceasefire are now quite cocky and are walking our roads and fields every day and every night and I think that's, you know, that isn't helping the peace process. I mean, the IRA called the cessation in the belief that uh, the, the causes of conflict could be and were about to be addressed. Now, if Britain is unwilling to address the causes of conflict, that wouldn't hold much hope for a peaceful future for, for Ireland or Britain. There's no point in, in say, for example, the IRA surrendering and, and handing on its weapons and all that stuff. If the whole issues which brought about the conflict haven't been resolved, because another generation will say, you know, that wasn't a, a fair settlement, you know, that, that's, there's injustices there and discriminations there, you know. I can't ask someone to live in a situation which I find unacceptable when I live there. Will this border continue to divide the land? Or can Ireland be united? What chance is there for a lasting peace in Northern Ireland? Can its people live together? And if the war is to end, 
Can the crimes of 25 years be forgiven? I have a difficulty sort of getting into the word even of forgiving. What, is it, what, is it, what does it mean? What does it involve? What does it entail? How do you forgive? Is it a good thing to forgive even? I mean, do I want to forgive? 18 years after the death of Robin's father, Christopher Ewart Biggs, the case is still open. No one has ever been charged. Nor has anyone yet been arrested for the murder of Gavin McShane. There doesn't seem to be any will for, um, say, the security force to catch the, the man that, that done it. Um, maybe that's why, you know, like, uh, there's a sort of an atmosphere that about us that, um, of fear, just, uh, in this part of the country where we live, uh, fear is very, very ripe, you know. There's that much has happened over the years to people who are just afraid to, to say, do witness, you know, to give, to tell what has happened. We're hoping that, um, Guilt will overtake fear with the people that they will come forward. Because it's our son today, somebody else's tomorrow. Robin Ewart Biggs has a continuing link with Ireland. The annual prize set up in his father's memory. Since his mother's death, he has managed the prize with his sisters. Its purpose is to reward literature or community work that reflects his father's belief in reconciliation. I have such mixed feelings and attitudes to Ireland and the Irish. I'm incredibly attracted to the whole way of life there, the kind of romanticization of themselves, of their history, of their culture, that comes out in wonderful music, literature, and all those things. And I also find that sort of unnerving. I find it very worrying in terms of the relationship that that has to the violence that goes on in Ireland. And I, th and I suppose the link that I see is on the surface condemning the violence, but on some more subliminal level, condoning the whole spirit of out of which that violence comes. When the Irish court released Dermot Finucane in 1990, Ailish joined him in the South, but it wasn't an easy reunion. I'm not a Republican, and I'm sort of not part of that Republican circle. And, you know, I just didn't feel as if I fitted in to that part of his life. Why are you not a Republican? Um, basically probably because I don't believe in killing people. I mean, there, there's other people who have tried other ways. I mean, and I can turn around and say, I mean, that the members of my family tried other ways. And, and the, the most glaring one is, is my brother, Pat, who, because he was the oldest, was able to complete his education. He went to university, became a lawyer. He became a very, very successful lawyer. In 1989, Pat Finucane was killed by loyalists. And his only crime was that he acted within the law. He used the law to win rights for people of Northern Ireland because he represented both sides. Although he was identified as being like a, a nationalist lawyer. Um, but I mean, he, he acted within the law and he was assassinated because of it. Because he, he was successfully challenging um, British injustice. When you know IRA people, you do expect them to get killed or imprisoned at some stage. But you're not preparing yourself for your friend who is innocent and he's not involved because you just don't expect them to die violently. Papa's best man at my wedding. Uh, he was the godfather of my daughter, Grania. Um, we were extremely close. Um, we were very good friends as well as brothers. And it's very hard to accept he's gone. There are people who are killed by IRA actions who are also not involved. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, I mean, it, it would be difficult for me to go into the specifics of any individual that was killed. 
But I mean, it, it is a fact. I mean, the IRA have killed innocent people. The whole situation of the North is that the, the, the conflict touches everyone, whether they're involved or not. And that's just the whole tragedy of it. That's a tragedy of war. It's not good enough to just say, I've, I'm killing people because of the circumstances I, I've, I've grown up in. It's not, it's, you know, it's not good enough to, to close the book like that and act, act, then act from that place. And where I really feel most strongly, I suppose, is in the lack I see in people in the area in Sinn Féin of being willing to go into that whole question of what choices they have about deciding to take that course. Dermot has been involved in these activities. How do you feel about that? Um, I do totally disagree with what Dermot has done. But Dermot's an individual and because I fell in love with him and married him doesn't mean to say that I can change him round to my way of thinking. I mean, he hasn't tried to change me round to his way of thinking. And it's the person inside him that I love. And, you know, I know everything he does, he does because he thinks it's right. And I think that's all you can ask of someone, that they follow their conscience. I mean, he can't follow my conscience. You know, he, he's his own person. One of the beautiful things about Elisha, I mean, is, is that she has maintained her own identity. You know, she hasn't been swallowed up by me. You know, I mean, she has her own politics, she has her own view in life. And I think her view in life has tampered mine. She hasn't made me become desensitized or brutalized, you know. And even though the spider ring I've, I've been through, I mean, I'm just an ordinary bloke. Although I'm, 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 I'm wary and fearful that, that people, for political reasons, will, will abuse this chance. I mean, I, I feel that there's an opportunity there to ensure that nobody else loses their lives, that nobody else gets hurt, that um, nobody else goes through what I went through, and that nobody ha else has to go through even what the IRA has inflicted upon them, that um, people in England don't have to die, people in Ireland don't have to die. I think there's a lot of hope. And I suppose in that, in sensing that hope, I sort of also, I sense a sort of distancing from it, that it's not actually, those aren't my problems in some way. Maybe it's, it's easier to walk away from it, seeing that hope and feeling that it's, something's happening. Um, mm. Some people would say that it was too late for us. It's, uh, yeah, it's too late now because of, of Gavin's death, but we have two more children. And because there's a ceasefire, we feel that if all sides stop killing, there'll be a future in this country for our other two children and everybody else's children.